All right. Um, all right, so we have uh, eight folks here, and you know, um, in the interest of time, we want to know who's in the room here. But we're gonna actually gonna have you uh, put this put this in the chat. Does that make sense, Drea? Yeah. So uh, Dre and I are gonna be facilitating this breakout session here, and. On the current slide that you see in your presentation window, we hey, we just want to know who's who's with us today. So if you could just type your name, comma. It this, it's, like a special. it's like a ed tech stem thing. Yep. Thank you. We're all we're all coming back, figuring out our uh, mute buttons. Very good. So yeah, name, school, what you're teaching, and then one thing that makes you feel safe and welcome in a learning environment. So. If you can uh, drop that in the chat there, that'll save us a bit of time here and we'll, we'll find out who's in the room. If you need the link to the slide deck again, Drea just pasted it in there. Morning, Aaron. So again, just introduce yourself in the chat here, your name, school, and the grade level, what you're teaching, and then one thing that makes you feel safe and welcomed in a learning environment. Good morning, Lauren. Uh, Smith Elementary, that's actually my school, so is Bill Roberts. Yes, positive and supportive people. Important to start the school year. Good morning, Ian at Polaris. All right, fifth grade. That's actually uh, my school also. Be working with, uh, I believe, Katie Ray. I hope Katie Ray's back there in the library. Being able to ask questions, very good. And Sid at Florence Crittenden. All right, high school math. Yay. Space to be who I am. Yes, no assumptions. Options, giving us options for how to participate. I like that. We're actually going to show you in a moment. Dre is here going to model Pear Deck. That's a great way, easy entry for a lot of kids to participate um, if they have preferred modalities to participate. And Nikita and Archuleta. All right, Archuleta starting a STEM program out there. We were out there last spring. Good morning, Nikita. Building relationships. Yep. Hopefully, you're starting to do that at your schools. Or if you're returning, you already have some of them. Oh, good morning, Kathy. Yes, Samuels teaching STEM. Kathy brought over probably 20 kids to our STEAM robot competition last year. And yes, smiling and greeting us all. All right, and there's Todd. Todd of Hamilton, all right. Ooh, flight and space. Love that medical detectives, energy in the environment. And it is, it's all about relationships. All right, well, thank you all for sharing. And um, we're gonna get the started here again. I'm Brian Dino. I'm an instructional coach, or digital coach for Collabs 3 and 5 and the, the K-8s. And uh, I'll let Dre reintroduce herself and tell us uh, what we're going to do in this session. Thanks, Brian. Um, yep, I'm Drea, and I support primarily our Pathways in High School Collaborative 2. I'm also a point person for one of our PDUs, so I can talk more about that later. But for right now, we are all here together in order to learn how to more effectively build these safe and welcoming learning spaces and you might be thinking to yourself like okay but what does that have to do with communication it has everything to do with communication so when we set up a safe and welcoming space that helps for our students to communicate with us with each other and with the broader community because they have that space um, built up and it has to be an intentional build with what you do so you starting the groundwork here and continuing to follow through with that groundwork is going to make it so much easier for uh, your kids to actually talk to each other and you. We're gonna, uh, in this session, learn how to use both Canva and Pear Deck in order to do this. Uh, those are the two 
tools that we're really going to focus on. And hopefully we'll have enough time to collaboratively workshop some resources that you can take and implement for your students next week. We are going to ground ourselves today in our CRE mindset of global context and building relationships. So when we're thinking about global context, we are shifting these power dynamics, these traditional power dynamics in the classroom from I'm the teacher, I do everything, I make the rules, you sit down and listen to me, to having more of a co-created space uh, where your students feel like they have voice uh, ownership over the space of their classroom and that that has been a co-created space. You'll hear me talk a lot about co-creating spaces. That does not mean student only created. It is truly co-created. So also as we're thinking about these strategies, this is not just a like, well, kids can do whatever they want and I can just be uncomfortable all the time. You are just as much a part of your classroom space as they are. So legitimately co-creating these uh, is going to be super impactful. And then obviously this is going to help you build relationships. If you have that safe and warm, uh, welcoming space, you're better able to build those relationships. And then also um, just to point out, you'll probably see this graphic 110 million times before the end of the school year, but all of the things that we're doing essentially are to support the instructional core, which is at the center of everything we do. The professional learning you receive, the energy and time we pour into these high quality instructional materials, and like making sure that we are assessing kids to see how we can better uh, support their learning. That all fits within creating this safe and welcoming environment. So as you can see, there's a lot of pieces to building this up. When we're talking about safe and inclusive learning environments, I know that we tend to throw out a lot of buzzwords, um, but what does it actually mean for students to feel safe and valued? Um, it looks a little bit of different ways. And so one of the things that we typically don't necessarily focus on is like students feeling physically safe and welcome. So like making sure that our students have the access and ability to move throughout the room as their bodies allow them to. Um, that's like a really key part and something that people who are uh, more able-bodied typically don't have to think about on a regular basis. So just again, getting to know who your uh, students are and how everybody can be accessible in your classroom space makes them feel physically safe and welcome. Also making sure that your uh, resources are organized, people can find everything. It's not like cluttered, hot mess all the time. That's also going to lead into you building an environment that is physically safe and welcoming. Students also need to feel emotionally safe and valued through positive uh, teacher and student relationships. And also uh, when they're feeling emotionally safe and valued, they'll feel included and respected. So their cultural identities will be respected and validated uh, through connections to content, you're uh, differentiating, personalizing learning for students, and also giving them that voice and choice in the classroom that's gonna give them ownership and autonomy. And let me just add, if you have any questions uh, throughout the next few minutes, you can put them in chat. You're welcome to come off mute. Uh, we have a smaller group here, so it's pretty informal. So uh, however uh, you want to um, ask questions is uh, pop them in the chat or just come off mute. Pretty informal here. So uh, when I was uh, in the classroom, we're still in a lot of classrooms. I still do a lot of co-teaching to model teachers um uh lesson lesson planning etc when but when i was uh i had my own classroom middle school and high uh middle school and high school i always co-created the the norms with the kids or try to co-create as much as possible with the students uh we have a video here we're not going to play but uh, i love this quote from the video where it says hey when students collaborate on the rules they are more likely to follow them leading to improved behavior and engagement. Um, and uh, for those of you who might be parents, this might be, a, this is a common parenting strategy too, depending on the age of your kids. But uh, when kids feel like they have a, a voice in the process, uh, when things uh, go off kilter or need correction, and they will, 
you can always come back to this and say, hey, we talked about this. We said this. We agreed on this. So uh, co-creating allows, again, to bring in all of those voices. Your trust building at the start of the year helps with conflict resolution. Um, I remember a student uh, who we had very challenges, uh, a lot of challenges with at the start of the school year regarding a field trip. And we had field trip norms we had co-created. And I was able to refer back to him and say, we agreed on this. Uh, you were a part of this and you're not following what we talked about on the field trip. So let's let's uh, fix that. Um, so a lot of advantages for co-creating with students uh, can be very empowering. Here's some examples of uh, some, some uh, documents or items you can co-create with your kids at the elementary level. I notice we have some uh, K through five teachers here. So again, your classroom norms, um, you co-create those. Chromebook rules, almost uh, all of our kids have devices now. Um, they certainly have the devices that we give them. Uh, so Chromebook rules, I've seen in a lot of classrooms. Uh, word walls can be created, uh, co-created with students. Lots of um, uh, documents you can co-create with kids. So there's some examples at the K-5 level. Uh, for the high school level, uh, or 6 through 12, uh, maybe some more, we'll see more uh, age-appropriate items you can create with your kids. Again, classroom norms, word walls, family-wide communication. You have upcoming parent, communi uh, parent uh, nights. What are kids going to go create? Are they going to do a showcase of their work? Uh, student work is always a very good to showcase. Social media, uh, that's a touchy area. Again, we're talking grade six through 12. I know, I know some high school teachers who have a, a social media presence from what they do uh, with their kids. So um, they might co-create some of that with uh, their students. And appropriate tech use. I'm sure if you're teaching six through 12 right now, um, hopefully you've had some conversations with your school on how you're going to handle tech use. And I'm not talking just Chromebooks, uh, we're talking uh, these cell phones. So uh, right now we don't have a district-wide policy on that. I think we just have guidance or guidelines, but unlike uh, Los Angeles public schools and other some other big school districts, we uh, I uh, have not issued uh, any directives on cell phone uh, bans or cell phone use. Uh, here's a, on this on this uh, slide here. Uh, I was at West High School last week for training and uh, saw some themes here. Uh, posters up that students had created that were um, lining the hallways here. So again, lots of examples of things you can co-create with your kids. And again, all in the interest of getting buy-in, your classroom is your community, your domain, um, and you want kids to feel welcome in there and sharing in the ownership. So how do you do this with an interactive way um, instead of, again, just uh, talking or lecturing for, for a long time on it? Let's get kids involved and this is where Dre is going to show you um, a really neat uh, neat tool that can help you get started on this. So yeah, um, like Brian was saying, we're going to go ahead and hop into Pear Deck. And Pear Deck is one of the things that I like to use when I'm supporting teachers, facilitating these Norman conversations at the beginning of the year. Because one of the really hard things about setting up positive classroom spaces is that when your kiddos come in, it's not set up. So you have to do the building work of that. And part of that is making sure that everybody's voices is heard um, and valued and input. So one of the ways that we can do that is through Pear Deck. Within this Pear Deck, you'll notice that I have um, all free tools that are like I'm utilizing. So you can utilize this on the free version of Pear Deck. If your school purchases Pear Deck, you'll have the full uh, premium version. I'm happy to come out. All of our coaches are experienced with Pear Deck, so they can come and support 
lead full on sessions about how to use, how to set it up, how to build it. But for our uh, purposes today, we are gonna go ahead and hop in and I'm just gonna go ahead and show you what I'm seeing on my side of things. So as we go into our Pear Deck, this is gonna be how I'm co-creating my space. Okay. Hold on one moment, Drea. We just had a couple of folks join us. Hey, in the chat there, the last link that Drea has, that's the link to Pear Deck there. So if you click on it, then you will actually be joining as a participant in Drea's session there. So we just had a couple of folks join us there. So click on that link and you'll, you'll follow along with Drea. Thank you. And I hope that this is one thing. Yep, perfect. Okay. So um, what I would have students do as they enter in here is I'd start them off with a warm welcome or a do now and just start having them process through what's the importance of rules? Like, why do we even have them? Why, why do we need them? What's the difference between rules and norms? That's what we're gonna go over during this lesson. And then we're gonna start to co-create those. I'm gonna ask about like something that's low stakes. It's not super serious off the bat. And again, it starts to have us think about, huh, there are rules in a lot of different aspects of our life and they can be appropriate and applicable. Um, so yes, then we're going to go in and talk about our non-negotiables. So for our non-negotiables, um, what I would talk about is these are our school-wide policies. So if you're here in the Pear Deck, go ahead and, especially if you're a returning teacher, you're turning to your building, what are some of those non-negotiables that are in your school? A lot of them are around cell phone policies. Keep your hands to yourself usually is a school-wide policy. <laughs> um, don't vape in my classroom, typically a school-wide policy. Things that I can uh, say or do, those could be school-wide policies. They're typically gonna be like your overarching like, hey, Admin is telling me that this is what we're doing as, as an entire building. Um, also, you'll notice that on my teacher dash side, I have access to all of those names there, but when I go to present and show my responses, it will show them in my um, presentation dash. Right now I'm showing you my teacher portal just so that you can see all of the behind the scenes stuff that I'm doing. Um, but after we talk about our non-negotiables, that's when I stop and I pause and I start to talk about circles of influence. So just like giving them that grounding perspective of like, what can I control and what do I have influence on? And the further outside of my circle I get, the less direct impact that I have. So if I can control myself and how I respond to things and my body, I'm the most control over that. Then within our space, we can co-create norms and we can hold ourselves uh, accountable to these norms and expectations that we set. But we also have to operate within the higher confines of our school and our larger community. So all of these things intermesh with each other and they all flow together. But there are only certain things that we have direct control over. And with those things, we are going to use them for good. We're going to use our powers for good. That's what I used to tell my kids all the time. Um, and we are going to co-create this classroom space together. So as we're thinking about that, I want to challenge my kiddos to think about how they want to feel. And I want to give them some space to really like internalize this so this is when i'm going to turn on my like lo-fi hip-hop jams and i'm just going to give them probably like again age dependent i used to be a middle school teacher so like five minutes just to like sit and think about how they want to feel and this is just like silent reflection time that they can just process the question a little bit and even if you have them in a full space and you want them to collaborate in small groups and do all of this thing Pear Deck gives them an opportunity to just sit and think and write in a safe space 
where you have access to that content later. And so even if you don't share any of the responses from Pear Deck, that's okay. You have them later on that you can go compile that information and make sure that like, if there are any like glaring holes in some of the things that your classes put together and you're missing a lot of chunks, you can revisit that the next day. Ian, what's up? Oh, well, I was just going to ask what you just, I, but you just did it. So you went to a slide because I haven't used Pear Deck. My team members use it. <laughs> so I want to get up to speed. But so you just switched to a place where I can type a response. So I can't just type anything at any time. Correct. So I have to set it up on my end with which slides I want interactivity on. And so there are some times where I intentionally don't have them interact with a slide. I just want them to think and process and like take it in. But then if I want to have them interact with that slide later, what I would do is I'd make a copy of that slide and then just put on a writing slide underneath it. And so as I'm having my students think about how they want to feel, then we're going to talk about what this looks like and what it doesn't look like. So sometimes I can really name what it looks like, but sometimes I can only describe like, okay, I definitely know that I don't want that. And so both places can be really good starting conversations. And so what I would have students do is after they've brainstormed their list of here's how I want to feel in this classroom, I would start to go through that list, pick out some of like the bigger, like, themes that I'm seeing, and I'm going to start to have them think about for each component, what does that look like when we're meeting that, and what does it not look like? And so if I am having them build that in, sometimes um, I've seen teachers give this to them afterwards of like, hey, in class, let's talk about it, let's have some discussion, and then they give them an asynchronous uh, student self-paced pair deck where they then go in and say like, okay, this is how this feels, this is how it doesn't feel. And after they've had that conversation time with some of their peers to hear different perspectives, you can definitely do that too. Um, but I think the biggest part is to make sure that you're allowing your students an opportunity to actually sit and think and give productive responses to these because sometimes what we ask students to do is we're saying, hey, you just sat down here and had no like idea what I was gonna ask you to do today, but what is the most important thing for you in a classroom environment? And they have no prep time and then they just like word vomit respect. So if you give them some time to actually think about it and dig into what does it look like and what does it not look like, these verbs become less buzzwords and become actual classroom norms. From here, what I would do is um, I definitely want to give my students space to give me some insight into what they need from me, what they need from peers, what they need from themselves, how I can support them in ways that like I don't necessarily need for other people to um, feed off of. I don't have to display these in any time. This can literally just be, I am collecting student data, I'm collecting student information, and I want it all in the same place. From there, what I can do is I can have students jigsaw. I can have students um, collaboratively make posters. I can have them, again, dig deeper into these norms and what they mean. The more understanding that you can have behind like your classroom policies and what that means, and then extending it a little bit further and like why it's important. These can all then be like these grounding conversations that you revisit throughout the year. And one of the things that we really wanna hit on as we're talking about establishing these co-created norms is that this cannot be something that you do once next week and then you never revisit again. That doesn't work. Um, what you need to do is when you build in these norms and these classroom expectations, they need to be integrated into your daily routines and procedures. Anytime that you're having them work in groups, anytime that you're having them have discussions, those norms and the expectations should always be grounded in your class norms and model that you are 
constantly going back. So even if it's clear to you, like, hey, I'm doing this because we're meeting our classroom norms, just tell them that. And then it'll be really like, it'll click for them. And by October, they'll be like, yeah, miss, you're doing this because of this, which is great because that means they've internalized it. Uh, it also is really helpful to create visual reminders throughout the classrooms, especially of those like high bucket norms um, that you are going to, again, constantly refer back to throughout your classroom. Uh, this is a great opportunity for your kids to jigsaw, get into small groups, and to really like get creative, make some classroom norm posters. Maybe you give small groups one norm each. Maybe you have them do all the norms. You can then have them like vote on different posters. The possibilities are endless. Um, so lots of different things that you can do in terms of that. Brian's going to go into a little bit more um, after this, but we also want to just make sure that we're providing that positive reinforcement when our norms are followed, especially after we're explicitly teaching and modeling these behaviors. So one thing I don't want to do is make these norms with my students and then opt myself out of them as the adult in the room. I need to hold myself accountable to those norms just as I hold my students. And again, once they see that this is reciprocal and that like, hey, we all follow the same norms to make this a safe classroom space, you're engaging in that global context, that power shift and co-creating that space. And you're essentially saying, hey, this is for me too. It's for everybody. And we're all holding each other to the same expectations. And then, of course, you're going to revisit, you're going to revise, and you're going to add to your norms as you need to throughout the year. There's going to be natural times throughout the semester where we're going to like, hey, we're going to do a reset. We're going to revisit our norms. And maybe we need to dig into what it looks like for these specific situations that we are experiencing in our class right now, because it is making it so that we can't be as productive as we need to be. And so having them say like, hey, maybe we're not changing our overall norm that we made at the beginning of the year. We're just giving some more, this is what it looks like and this is what it doesn't look like. We're giving more clarification to it. We're adding or expanding. Or maybe we have a norm that we didn't phrase super well at the beginning of the year and that we just need to revisit completely. And that can be a process that you engage in with your class. Hey, any any uh, thoughts, questions right now? Anybody use Pear Deck before? Or do they use any other tools to gather student thoughts? You can either come off mute or put them in the chat. Yeah, okay. Aaron used it during COVID. Yes, a lot of Pear Deck usage during COVID. Uh, going back to our opening, uh, remember, uh, Sid put in the uh, chat that you need to have different options for kids to participate. And that's what I like about Pear Deck is everybody has a way to respond. So if they're shy or anxious, especially at the start of the year, and they don't want to uh, vocalize their thoughts, Pear Deck gives them a safe space and only you can see that. Uh, you as you don't need to share the responses to everybody, but it gives them the way to participate, um, I would say silently. So it is a, another option for them. Um, yeah, and uh, Sid just said, yeah, it's good to see student responses right away. Sometimes you'll uh, find some kid just uh, wanna talk to you in written form and you might find out a lot more than uh, you would without a tool like that. Uh, we'll have some more resources uh, for Pear Deck at the end of this because uh, this time of year we get a lot of questions. Drea showed you the free version, um, and there is a paid version that gives you some more features. But even just with the free version, um, you uh, you can do a lot with it. I like it especially for grade 6 through 12 because with everybody on a Chromebook, we know there's a, a opportunities for multitasking and what do you want. Pear Deck is the, one of the few tools available where it's like, you are following me, I am putting the content on your screen. So we're all in this together. Um, and uh, it's one way to really control that moment of the classroom. All right, so let's say you've gathered class 
uh, feedback there. As Dre just showed, you've got some the, the students' ideas for norms. How are you going to publish them? How are you going to print those? So this is our, our next, uh, another tool you can use to do that. Um, it's Canva. And uh, there's lots of pre-made Canva templates here. And I'm actually, um, let me just share my screen here. Um, okay. So if you click on Canva templates here, I'm going to click on Canva templates. And Canva is a multi faceted graphic design tool that we have this year. It's available to all schools. Um, I'm sure some of you have already uh, explored or, or used it. Right here, there's, you can see they're ready for the school year. There's already pre-made classroom rules from, for all sets of ages here. Uh, here's one perhaps for uh, maybe high school, it's a little more serious. Uh, here's one uh, for uh, maybe a little more colorful for K through five. So lots of templates here, classroom rules. If you're not happy with these, you can come over to the left side and do a creative design and you can start one from scratch. Um, but again, if you're interested in saving time, I'm just gonna pick one here. Um, you can select one and then all, almost all of the templates are customizable and I'm going to click on customize this template and let's say, let's say, um, um, let's say where, let's say we're the wolf pack. Maybe our class is the wolf pack. There we go. Wolf pack classroom rules so um i picked a very i picked a very elaborate one uh so i can modify it and then let's say i want the kids to break up into groups and they're going to create a poster and then we'll pick one or we'll we'll print them and decide which one we want to hang up uh, I can share this now as a template with Canva. So I'm going to go up to my right-hand side where it says share. And it works very similar to Google, the Google uh, platform and sharing. First, I have to set my directions here. Uh, the collaboration link uh, right now only I can access. Uh, I'm going to decide just to share this link with my students. And I'm going to click anyone, I select anyone with the link can edit it. I have other options there too, if they just want to view or comment on it. But since I want them to actually get into this Canva graphic and edit it, I'm going to leave it on edit. And then I'm going to uh, copy the link. And with that link, I can share it out whatever uh, method I want in my classroom. So if you're K through five and you're using Google Classroom, uh, use the Google Classroom link right here I'm going to demonstrate that. I'll just click on Google Classroom and click Continue, and it integrates into my Google Classroom. Up should come my uh, current Google Classrooms. Uh, these are just, um, let me just pick a STEM class, and then I can make a new assignment. So right now, it's just showing brian's oh. uh, browser tab so he, yeah. right now he's just going through and he's selecting his classes within google classroom um you should see a similar thing if you're using google classroom yep let me just show that there you go so here's what um the screen you didn't see but i went through the google classroom and it integrated well uh, right into my google classroom and shared that link so it's a nice time saver on that um if I wanted to, let me just go back to that. If I wanted to share it into Schoology, uh, same thing. I would just go up to, sh again, go up to share. I would copy the link and I would go into Schoology and I would 
uh, share that link through an assignment or maybe through just a, the link, however. And if you're not, uh, however you're distributing curriculum to your kids, maybe it's just through a Google Doc or it's through um, um, uh, Seesaw, any other tool. Once you have the link, when the kids click on this, they will come into the document and then they can edit it and they can um, create their norms and however you want to uh, finish up that assignment in your classroom. So that's a quick overview of how uh, you can do Canva. Um, and again, uh, Canva shines in all of its templates. So um, you can save yourself lots of time. We actually have a, a whole, we'll share with you at the end here, our resources for Canva. And actually later on today, um, I believe there are some Canva re uh, sessions, but they, I think they're all in person at South High School. Is that right, Drea? So those are not virtual, but um, we do have a Canva, somebody from Canva uh, demonstrating and doing courses in Canva today. Um, questions? Any Canva power users out there, Canva users? Kathy's a Canva user, okay. Lauren lives on Canva, yeah, okay. So I, yeah, it's becoming a mainstay um, in a lot of teacher classrooms. It's very powerful now. You can do screencasts with it. You can do green screening with it, uh, tutorials with it. It is a multifaceted tool. So with our last 10-ish minutes that we have together before we hop back on in the main room, this is your time to go forth, explore uh, some resources that we have. So if you go back to our deck um, on that next page, so slide 26, 25, sorry, um, you'll see our resources page that uh has a bunch of different articles so if you uh liked the pair deck that you were in or like you like it as a starting point i've linked the google sheets version so that'll be your editable version that you can make a copy um i absolutely will drop the deck in the chat again but yes if you have any questions you want to brainstorm anything now is your opportunity to hop off chat Otherwise, Brian and I will let you explore. We would love, again, for you to just think through how you're going to set up these beginning of the year practices with your students, give you some space and time to do that. And we're here. <laughs>